Yes. Um, pleasure to see you, ladies and gentlemen, and um, um, a remark that it's considered okay to uh, get up and uh, get something to eat or drink. If there's anything left. No, we have um, only we have more people than signed up. We have more people than signed up. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's what a great happens. pleasure. <laughs> and what, our guest is Deirdre McCoskey, who's a distinguished professor of economics, presently at the University of Illinois at Chicago, in economics, history, English, and communication, all of those things together and summed up. <laughs> Before that, she was a professor of history at, uh, at Iowa, the University of Iowa. Before that, an associate professor of history and economics at the uh, University of, uh, of Chicago. She got her bachelor's in uh, economics at Harvard, graduated in 1964. Her PhD, uh, also at Harvard, uh, later on, <coughs> in the 70s, and uh, has uh, written a, a number of books. Uh, starting, I guess, with her dissertation in yeah. economic history, um, economic maturity and entrepreneurial decline, British iron and steel, 1870 <laughs> to 1913. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Yeah, that's boring. That's boring. <laughs> <laughs> I would never say boring. <laughs> 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 we were only iron, but for, since it's also on iron and steel. And steel. <laughs> 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 Yes, you're right, that does it. And then uh, Enterprise and Trade in Victorian Britain. So these are very, these are, uh, you're in economic history. I was an economic historian. Yeah. Was, uh, economic history. Yeah. yeah, and then she started to branch out and get a little uh, restless. <coughs> Snow White, but I drifted. Yes. <laughs> That's my <laughs> That's That is okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we need to have the election of May West. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so she got into the rhetoric of economics, or if you're so smart, the narrative of economic expertise, sort of getting to turn on your comments a little bit. <laughs> Knowledge and persuasion in economics. Oh, and this is on her personal life, crossing a memoir. She just remarked to me that it's harder to stop smoking than change your sex. <laughs> <laughs> it takes longer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and now this, this great uh, uh, enterprise, which is uh, underway but not finished on the bourgeois virtues <laughs> and bourgeois dignity, those are the two that are published? Yeah, those are the two that are published. And uh, there is either three or four or five or six. Uh, it depends. If you there. encourage me, I'll do more. Yeah. <laughs> and meanwhile, Deirdre, you've decorated the wall behind us yes. to, yes. uh, um, to uh, astonish us. So why don't you begin and uh, give, I, us a, give us a brief talk and then, I will. Uh, then we'll all have questions. And I hope you'll uh, feel free to ask questions of any sort um, anytime you feel like. Uh, I was spent my youth at the University of Chicago in economics and history and at Chicago, you know, Milton Friedman would say, well, are there any comments on the first page? <laughs> <laughs> and so we got to it immediately, so we do feel free. And this is a, um, an outline, whoops, I'm in the way of the outline, of the, uh, of, of the four books I'm determined to write. And there's five and six that I may write. Um, and what these amount to is an attempt at a full-scale defense of what we call capitalism. Full-scale in the sense that I don't want to confine it to matters of prudence only. I don't want only to say, as my colleagues frequently say, that boy, capitalism makes you rich, although that's a terribly important fact. I, I must say, I don't much like the word capitalism. Um, it was, after all, um, the ismos part was forced on us by our enemies. So it's not too surprising that it doesn't fit the, the system very well. To call it capitalism misleads people. It makes them think, as, as, as economists do think, and Adam Smith through Marx for a little 
right down to the young president, that capital accumulation is the key to this modern innovative economy in which everyone in this room is a beneficiary. And I don't think that's right. I, I don't think it's <coughs> capital accumulation, as I argue in my this number two here, it's published in 2010. Um, it's, it's innovation that matters. It's invention. It's new ideas. It's what the Austrian economists, a small branch of modern economics, call discovery. Hayek and, and Israel Kirzner and so forth say, that, that modern economic growth was a free lunch in a lot of ways. In fact, its first principal component, so to speak, its largest cause, its the, the biggest contributor, was innovation, not capital accumulation. Because after all, capital accumulation is, comes with humanness. You make an accent um, not only for immediate consumption, but as an investment. Um, so, so it, it, um, my, my friend Matt Ridley, an English journalist of some uh, prominence, a science writer, has on his desk a mouse. Mouse, not an extra mouse. <laughs> a mouse and a hand axe that, that he must have stolen from St. Museum or something. And they're they're about the same size and size, and they're both meant to fit the human hand. And the mouse embodies the gigantic change in knowledge um, that's happened since the 1800s. Um, and that's what I think uh, is the uh, cause of modern economic growth. Now, what was then the cause of this, this, um, these innovations? Were they about incentives, as my colleagues in economics so wish? And uh, what I call Samuelsonian economists after my mom's next Devil's partner Paul Samuelson, the 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 um, they so want incentives, prices, punishments and rewards to be the story of human life. They want everything to to fit on that. That, that. for example, um, free economics. Uh, is all about incentives, incentives, incentives. That's why, that's one of two reasons I don't like the, the book called the author. He's a very nice man. Um, so if it's not incentives, dear, what is it? Well, my claim is that there was an ideological change. And I'm, I'm, I'm documenting the ideological change in volume three. Convenient because if you have any doubts, I can say, well, you know, wait until volume three, hurry down to your University of Chicago outlet and try that. Um, the, there was an ideological change, and it was essentially a change from an aristocratic society, a hierarchical society, where virtu, to speak in Machiavellian, Terms had well some parts of it uh, um, had the de definition of aristocratic virtue to a society in which virtue was commercial. Um, and example of this is Il Cortigiano, the the. The, 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 
Borgia, a handbook of how to be a Renaissance prince or still more to the point, a me member of a court in the, the Renaissance. And, and even though <laughs> these uh, the aristocrats were themselves often the descendants of the bourgeoisie, and even though their great wealth depended on Florentine wool cloth and banking, there's all through the, the, the book, there's a kind of contempt for trade. And, um, you know, a ah, disgusting market. Yuck. And there's nothing, there's, there, there's, there, there's no talk at all in this very innovative age of innovation in Shakespeare. The heroes, if they're not um, shepherds, are dukes, largely. <coughs> the one exception might, you might say is the merchant of Venice. But wait a second. Antonio is a fool for love. He's the merchant of Venice. And then there's Shadow. And the hero is Bessanio, um, uh, Antonio's intended um, on, on parable. And he's an aristocrat and embodies none of the bourgeois virtues. On the contrary, the whole movement of the play, or at least the, the problem in the play, is created by this necessity for or Bassanio to put on a good aristocratic show. Um, now, then you might say, well, OK, there was this, this moral change. This, well, I would call it, indeed, a rhetorical change and an ethical change. A change in, what, in, in the way people talked about what they thought was good. Now, I'm not saying, uh, in homage to Max Baker, we have a, a close student of uh, the honored Marx here. It's, it's not internal psychological change that I'm talking about. That's Baker's claim, and I think it's doubtful. We can, we can talk about it if you want. No, it's sociological and, and cool. Critical change. It's 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 not the habits of the heart. It's the habits of the lip and of the um, and that sort of the lip and the writ. It's the, the the sociology how we view other people and the how we allow other people to um, do or not do what they so there was an ideological change, and, and, and you see, I mean, it's rather obvious in a way. I mean, that Adam Smith, the blessed Adam Smith, and and, um, and 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 I, I sputter, by the way. <laughs> and Tocqueville, who with a with a certain aristocratic. What would you call it? Distaste um, talks about England in um, as a great field for bourgeois act, 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 activity, and as England achieving the liberty that his home country kept following up, kept not quite knowing how to achieve. So there, there are. Uh, Terry, you know, supported himself by being rich by speculating on the stock exchange. It's not from his, his plays that he made his most money. It was by being a bourgeois. Um, though with the continuing aristocratic pretensions that we still have, these ideologies don't ever die. In fact, I, I claim that, that 
clerisy, as I call it. I am Samuel. and the intellectuals and the academics, the clerisy. And the clerisy <coughs> has revived aristocratic values. And we talk of ourselves as an aristocracy of merit. Not just an aristocracy of blood. In fact, we're, we're ashamed to talk of blood, we talk of merit. But still, we have not bourgeois attitudes. We have for better or worse, we, we people in this room have a room aristocratic attitudes. So, so, so what's it all about? Well, I started this series with a book asking, which you, you, you have the first few manuscript pages of. It's a long book, it's 500 pages. I, I, I once knew how to write short books, but I seem to have lost the ability and it correlates very closely with the coming of a personal computer into my life. It's <laughs> just so easy to cut and paste. It offers no resistance, whereas my, my father's old underwood <laughs> offered a lot of resistance. Anyway, I ask the question, can you be virtuous in a market society, in a society of markets and innovation? Can you be virtuous in a society in which one of the sort of constitutional or constituting uh, 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 principles of the society is, is the acceptance of creative destruction? where we don't allow the bourgeoisie, unless they go to Congress and purchase it at a surprisingly low price, <laughs> we do not permit the bourgeoisie to form monopolies. We do not assume that uh, only um, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Washingtons and the Jeffersons are appropriate when we move leaders, we occasionally allow Jacksons and Lincolns in, where, where um, <coughs> it is such a society of revalued ordinary people, especially revalued middle class people, since most of the forward movement of any market society of innovation is from the middle class. Is such a society so constituted um, consistent with virtue? Of course, it's not consistent with virtue if virtue is defined to mean aristocratic behavior in every way. If, if you start with, with the definition that the clerisy is to start with, or to be more the point, the not more the point, but another parallel point is that, that the clergy tends to start with. I'm an Anglican, but um, I, I don't um, believe that the clergy's way of looking at the world is the only sound one. If you start from that and say that's virtue, if virtue is being a saint or a soldier, then they are, it's going to be really easy to show that virtuous people are, well, uh, saints and soldiers. If that's how you define virtue, it's going to be a problem. But in the book, I come finally, I, as I've organized the book badly, I think organization is my strong point in, in, in prose. This comes around page 250 or something, 280 in a long book. And it ought to have been earlier. Here's the master diagram. Here's the executive summary of the, my book, The Bourgeois Virtues. Here are 
the seven principal virtues, according to a long, long tradition in the West. You can find parallel virtues in the East, in, in Confucian thought. It's completely unsurprising that courage, which is a virtue that all human beings need, uh, is valued, and that, and that prudence, viewed as savoir faire, or phronesis, common sense, know-how, is valued, and certainly in, in Confucius, no justice is a big deal. Uh, faith, in a certain way, is. But I'm talking, for the moment, about the, the tradition in conventionally defined West. And one starts in the Mediterranean world with the so-called cardinal virtues for points of the compass was what they were referring to. And these were courage above all in a society, in a, 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 a polis or a Homeric camp, constantly at war, courage. Um, control of fear. Justice, social balance, um, orderliness in our, in our lives in public, and temperance has, has personal balance. My hero, Adam Smith, in the theory of morals, in the theory of moral sentiments, talks of these four virtues in very much these terms. Um, Self-command is his phrase for, for temperance. And then prudence. Prudence is a virtue. Prudence is not greed. Greed is the exercise of prudence. That this is the theological analysis of sin in the uh, in in Christianity. Greed is the exercise of prudence only. Prudence without the balance of the other virtues. Prudence without justice and love and courage and hope and faith and, and, and temperance is that greed that is supposed to be good over in the economics department. Now, you know, sensible economists don't say that, but unfortunately there are lots of nonsensical economists. Um, although I'm an economist right down to my, my little wingtip shoes. Um, so these four are called, eventually are called the pagan virtues because they're, um, they're the ones that the Roman and Greek the classical world focused on. And, they're, and these three, in fact, and, and in a, in a warlike polis with a fourth two, are necessary for the survival of public life. So these could also be called the political virtues in the root sense and in our sense. The political virtues, justice, courage, influence, and prudence. Now, the way economics operates, as you may know, and, and a lot of Econo wannabe fields like rational choice theory in science and sociology is to say all we need is prudence. Give me this this horrible not well, you know, I don't think he's horrible. He's been a friend of mine for many years. Max you. His first name is Max, his last name is you. Maximum utility. <laughs> this is Samuel Sonianism, as I mentioned. Max was a Vietnamese Cambodian, I guess. Or I mean, a, I'm sorry, I'm not Cambodian, a, 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 a Vietnamese Jew. Um, I, I've always said that Max would be a more sensible person if he had a gender change and became Maxine. 
<laughs> so Max U is all that most of my economist colleagues want to admit into the argument. And I want to persuade them, and that's one of the purposes of these four books, to move beyond Max U and to develop not a free economics, but a humanomics. An economics that um, is based on a broader ethical theory than I'm all right, Jack. I've got mine. That's not a very satisfactory ethical theory, and it's not one that um, whose corresponding politics is good for us. So, <coughs> a few points before I stop. Observe that these aren't just randomly up here on the board, although it may seem like it at first. Observe that, oh, and, and by the way, these are the, these I claim, and so does St. Thomas Aquinas, <laughs> and so does Adam Smith. Um, in his somewhat pared down version of these seven. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention. These then are the theological virtues. Pagan virtues, theological virtues, and the ethical system in the West up till the 18th century, up till um, Kant and Mandeville and, and Bentham and the Camus and the Camus contract Unitarians before uh, uh, Locke and, and, and Rousseau and so forth. Up until then, this was the ethical, this was the way of talking about ethics in the West. And it's a jury-rigged um, uh, combination of the four pagan virtues and the three theological virtues. A revival of this way of talking a revival, very interestingly, accomplished primarily by English, female English philosophers in the 1950s and, 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 and 60s, such as uh, Anscombe, um, is called virtue ethics, to be contrasted with utilitarian ethics or um, Kantian ethics. I spend a, a, I, the book, not that book, but the other one that's circulated, is, as I said, is an ethics for an age of commerce. It's a discussion of these, this, this system of the virtues in relationship to, to, to bourgeois societies. Can you, is, what's the, what how does a commercial society affect these virtues? How do they survive in a commercial society? What versions of them are most useful or most prevalent in a commercial society? How can we defend a full, a full system of the virtues in a commercial society? How can we prevent agency theory, as it's called over in the business school, from taking over our lives? the history of the world economy in the last three years has been a, a, a showing that prudence only um, max you isn't enough. Hope is not just hope for life eternal, but is the virtue of having a project, having a purpose. Faith is not just I believe in, in God, the maker of the world, and the Son, blah, 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 but is having an identity. So out of an identity comes purposes, and the purposes are a matter of love. Love of science, love of truth, love of baseball, love of nation, love of family in some versions, love of a, trans, of a transcendent character, the kind of love we call ideals. They can be bad, they can 
can be good. But in any case, a person without these three theological virtues goes home this afternoon and shoots himself. Or maybe should. Uh, because he's, he's, a, he's a machine with just as courage, temperance, and prudence with no point. He, he, de he, he doesn't answer the question, Yiddish nu? Or can they say in Dutch, en? I was in French, how do they say in French? Hello. 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 So one has to have all of them, and my claim is that they're the primary colors of a virtuous life, a virtuous human life. Not a virtue, not a life of any rational being, as Kant said, and not a life of a, of a, of a pleasure maximizing sort. We had some great ice cream last night in commemoration of being back in New England. My, my, my mom and I, uh, maple nut, characteristically New England ice cream from this shop over in Mass Ave. What's it called? J.P. Licks? Yeah, Licks. Wow, was it good. <laughs> and, and I was once in Paris alone, this was a long time ago, um, and I wanted a good meal of an evening by myself. It's, that's not hard to do in Paris. And then they had a dessert, kind of a creme brulee, but it was better than creme brulee, if you can imagine it. <laughs> and I thought to myself, let me let me give up my professorship. Let me cash it in for whatever I can get. <laughs> and sell my house and my children and so on and, and come to Paris and live here in a, in a garret and eat this dessert for the rest of my life. <laughs> and that's, that's Max Hume. <laughs> neither of those, neither of those is, a, is, a, is a real human life. This is. This is how we tell stories. This is how we commend each other and always have. This is how we talk ethically. Now, just to end, what does all this have to do with capitalism? Well, my claim in the book, and it's, I make it throughout in great detail. I urge you to read the book, or most particularly buy it. <laughs> and um, if it's prudence only isn't it, look, you, for example, entrepreneurship, a ter terribly important part of a vibrant, innovative economy. I've been, I've been arguing with my friend David Landis for approximately, let's see, how many years? Um, about 50 years, but he's wrong about entrepreneurship and I'm right. Uh, I spent the first half of my career as an economic historian showing that David Landis was wrong, that entrepreneurship didn't matter, that all that mattered were material things. I was a former Marxist, I was an economist, I believe that matter conquers all. And I was, and now I'm condemned to spend the second half of my career saying, whoops, Landis was right. <laughs> um, entrepreneurship is hope <coughs> combined with courage and prudence. That's how it can be characterized. If these are primary colors, if these seven, these particular seven, can be combined in various ways to make other virtues, purity, enterprise, whatever, and you can't go the other way. You can't take purity and enterprise and honesty and make them into these. Then you've got primary colors, red, blue, yellow. And that's what these are. So my claim is, throughout the book, over and over again, well, it's kind of three things that are, <laughs> that are, are somewhat confused, you see. But that's, that's, I can't help it, they're confused. First, 
modern capitalism exhibits these. Exhibits these. So it's not true that the people on Wall Street are all a bunch of um, bad people. Many of them are, but <laughs> not all of them. And I've known lots of people in business who are in every way upstanding in this way. A surprising case is John D. Rockefeller. There's a very good biography by a popular biographer, I forget his name, of, of Rockefeller. And you read in this book that Rockefeller was not a tyrant in the boardroom. He gave to charity all of his life, even when he was poor. He was a very reasonable man. He listened to what other people said. He was by no means. It was the way he looked that gave people the idea that he was some sort of monster. So anyway, um, hope, courage, prudence, um, uh, justice, temperance and prudence might figure in the, um, in, the, in the professionalism of a banker. I heard a wonderful talk at uh, the Deloitte College about a, about a year ago by a banker who had been successful on Wall Street but decided to come back to be, so to speak, a country banker, a banker in his hometown. It's like, uh, it's a wonderful life. So he came back to be the banker, and he, he, he if he's telling the truth, maybe he's a liar, mm -hmm. but, but he said that he found that much more satisfactory and that he could exercise all his powers as a human in being a banker. So that's the first point. <coughs> in actual fact, not all business people <coughs> are rogues. Now, this, is, this, is, this rather simple argument is one that I get a lot of argument against in the English department, where I also <laughs> teach. They said, oh no, no, they're all rogues. <laughs> oh dear, I, I have a sense of proof. Yeah. So what, what you seem to suggest is that this, uh, this banking of manufacturing come, country home. Yeah. Uh, it, does it mean that these bankers are going to Wall Street and for a few years they just don't want to be a human being, they just want to make money and then once they're outside Wall Street they become humans again? Yeah. <laughs> which, which means that then the system is creating these sort of bubbles into which you don't like right. as a human being and then outside you can. That's so right. Bubbles, Absolutely. And so does every other society. So does a society of, of a society of a sub-society. Let's talk it that way. A sub-society of secular clergy in the Middle Ages uh, intent on increasing the quality of the stock of wine in their, in their, in their uh, um, cellars and, and, and placing all their cousins in high positions in the church. So does, so, so do you become inhuman and mechanical on a, on a battlefield. Uh, so, you, so are you inhuman and mechanical as a person hoeing? There's a very fine essay by Emerson. Um, which one is it? I think it's in the, it's called The American Scholar. And he says, we want people who are exercising all their, all their gifts and, as human beings, not specialized hands, you speak of hands on a ship, or specialized brains and vats in universities. So I, I think what, what you say is true. That is that uh, capital. It's a. This is a point that um, who's the political scientist at the um, Institute for Advanced Study? Guy was at Harvard a long time ago. Hirschman. No, not Hirschman. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the point that Michael Walzer makes. He's asked, "Is capitalism corrupting?" Yeah. It's corrupting. 
it makes people into less than fully ethical people or can. But then he points out quite correctly that so does every other. So does every other way. So what is this that every other way is also corrupted? So what, what, what makes it corrupt? Well, if, you give, if your only value is courage, you're not interested in justice towards the peasants. If your only value is justice, you're not interested in mercy. If your only value is temperance, you're not world enjoying as humans should be, theologically speaking. If God created the world, we, we, we the Christians say it, we ought to enjoy it. But Can I ask you a related question about that? Uh, am I reading you correctly to saying you don't? You think the concept of, you're against the concept of economic math. Yes, I am. So that this, this 18th century development where you separate out economic activity and you rationalize it. That's right. Based on primary desires, which is often characterized as greed, but, but well, if you can say self-interest, <coughs> you think of that as a falsification of human nature, and that's, that's the problem here. I do, and, and Anyone who's had a job knows that I'm correct. <laughs> I mean, anyone who's held a job um, knows that in an office or a work gang or, or a commercial kitchen, there's, there's more going on than maximization. Yeah, but does that mean that you don't believe that there's a science of economics? I don't. I, I believe the science of economics since Adam Smith has been gravely misled. And Adam Smith had it right. He wrote two books, which means he wouldn't get tenure of any self-respecting history of that. He <laughs> would not be a full professor. Um, but he only wrote two books. One was The Wealth of Nations. I hadn't even heard about the theory of moral sentiments until about 20 years ago. So he's, he's got a He's got a, a um, an idea of an emerging. Well, he, he's the ideologist of this new society. He's being, of course, pulled back all the time by by aristocracy. But he and <coughs> you too, you um, were es escaping from. Him. And, he, then they're not the only ones. There are people, people from France and Italy doing the same thing, trying to create an ideology in which you can be virtuous and a capitalist. But let, let, let me just finish my list. It's simple. Um, <coughs> present day business people are good on the whole, and they should be better. <laughs> now that's a, a little bit of a contradiction, you see, because I thought you said they were good. How are we going to, you know, okay, so there's, there's that problem. And the science of watching them should not assume they're only motivated by Max Hugh. I'm against economic freedom. I'm sure you answered this question many times, but the proverbial elephant in the room is maybe in European history, specifically the Christian tradition. Yeah. So, 250 years ago, maybe we had this very complex and rich ecology of values. How do you make it go in a world in which something like Christianity, with that kind of existential power, uh, isn't persuasive to enough people anymore? I agree. That, that, that's the problem. I'm trying to provide another purpose of these books is to provide my fellow citizens of liberal societies, in the old sense of the word, with a transcendent, with a point. Now, I, I suppose I prefer that they become members of the Episcopal church. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm perfectly welcome to invite you all over this afternoon over to Christchurch and we'll baptize you all now. But, but 
you're right. There, there is this loss. This um, what there are various ways of expressing this. One way that I say Berlin makes very persuasive is that romanticism becomes the substitute for the transcendent, the glorification of the hero, of the individual. All this talk of individualism that we in the United States especially are so interested in can be laid down on German romanticism. And we're still in the romantic age. We're still searching for our inner, with the inner dear to stand up. So that's one transcendent. But of course, you know, is this, this sort of contradictory dual propositions. They are virtuous, and they should be more virtuous, says. People actually do achieve trans, tra, tra, uh, they're always searching for it. The, the man becomes obsessed with model trans. And then model trans become his transcendent. And, yeah? Oh, if his models, if his model trains become his transcendence, how is it, it, it how, could you just define how model trains becoming transcendence differs from maximum utility for that particular man if each one has well, a Well, because it's not, it's not about maximum utility in a way. He's, he, he does, I don't know why you talk about trains, so let's just, uh, that leaves me free to speculate. You know, that I imagine that among model train enthusiasts there are all kinds of um, ethical, um, rules, so to speak. For example, I'm sure that it's regarded as a terrible thing in model trainedom to claim that you've made, I, they call it a, a setup, I think. You've made, look, this is about the size of a big model train. Um, it's arrangement here. It's going, it's on the hilt. To claim that you made it when someone else did. That surely would be a violation of not training. On the other hand, it would be commonplace in an aristocratic society where work is not valued, where, where action is valued. Um, but, well, to, let me express it again in a quasi crude, 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 personal terms. In an aristocratic society, Pride, superbia, the Romans say, is a good thing. <laughs> Whereas in Christian society, it's the master sin. It's the chief sin against the Holy Spirit. So, so each form of life has its set of virtues. Um, this is very sort of sort of sort of sort of Macintyrish. Uh, every practice, as, as Alistair says, has a, a corresponding set of, sort of ways of judging whether the practice is good or not. If you're, if you're a chess player, there are rules. You're not allowed to you know, say, oh, look, I'm going to make the knight move as a queen in a moment. So it, but, but I don't want to emphasize the rules too much, because there's another version of Max U that's become very popular which is um, the neo-institutionalism of, of Douglas North and company. Uh, over here, um, um, Asimovu is a case of this. And they think that, that, that rules, constraints, that, that institutions are rules of games. In the sort of, not sort of, but in the sense that the move of the knight is a rule in chess. And I, I don't think that's an adequate, uh, anything like an adequate, um, adequate um, uh, characterization of the human drama. The human drama involves lots of conflicting, unfungible, insubstitutable, or partially substitutable values. If, if you don't believe that, then you don't. You, then you don't believe in tragedy. Uh, I wasn't going to ask about uh, John Stuart Mill. I'd be interested to hear. Um, 
you know, whether you think that your project is similar because it doesn't use the virtue language, right. this sort of master category of civilization, yet the argument's similar. Um, it is. But, you know, but more, more pointedly, I mean, Charles Taylor, et cetera, if we're talking about the Alistair McIntyre hand that um, criticizes expressivism and sources of the self. And it seems that this is a pretty expressive project. What, why um, would your critics not say that um, if you're a Smithian, um, anti-statist, egalitarian, with laissez-faire leanings, um, yeah, <laughs> you know, that um, thinks that um, the bourgeois, bourgeois virtues are entirely consistent with um, um, uh, a sort of individualism and expressivism, etc. We find our own project. Um, you use the word, I think, self-fashioning or self-creation, etc. I don't use that word, but but I use I use similar words. Yeah. Um, well, something similar. So so why is this not just? I mean, this is obviously a very related question, but we've heard already. Sure. Why is not this just a possible project among many uh, that is not may not be persuasive? Uh, too many and would require something like authority, um, the education of the church, or yeah. the well, I, 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 th I, I, you know, I'm, you, you and I are of the Romantic era, so we're stuck. We're we're inclined to expressivism, right? Mm -hmm. And we, you're suggesting that I should rage against it. I should I should resist it. And, and I see what you mean. You're, you're, I, I, you don't take it that you're, you're, you're arguing that, that, how, how, do, how do I ground all this? Um, and to that I answer, well, I'm a liberal. I'm a John Stuart Mill type liberal. And I don't want to ground things. Um, on the other hand, I'm very willing to let other people ground things if they want in Christianity or whatever. Um, I look here, here. Here's one way to answer this. Let's take Kant, and let's take his. Ethical argument. He says any rational creature would want to follow the um, the categorical imperative. Okay, that's, that's, I understand it's not new. Oh, yeah. But but the trouble is <laughs> that early in that book he says you must. I haven't examined the German. I I should, because I'd like to be able to quote the very phrase where he says, says, you must follow the laws of reason. Well, who says? There's a kind of absence of grounding in his grounding. And my claim is that in order for Kant to get where he wants to go with um, his ethical and political projects, he needs the virtues. He needs named virtues that this rational decision maker, as we'd say in economics, has already. I, I mean, I say uh, that came out in um, what's it called? Uh, in, uh, in, uh, um, <coughs> annuals in political theory. I forget what the exact title is, but. It, Came out just this year, where, where I, where I go after Hobbes and Kant and uh, um, and Martha Nussbaum and Rawls and James Buchanan and all those people who have a, a um, what they think is a nice snappy system where they start with one virtue in the case of Hobbes or with two, justice and prudence in the case of Rawls, or three, in the case of Martha, prudence, justice, and love. And then they, they 
a complete person emerges or in a complete society emerges from that. And I say it's like pulling rabbits from a hedge. You've got to put the rabbits in first. So I, I'm not sure I'm responding to you, but the, what, what you want me to be is a, is a foundationalist, and I'm not. Argue with me. Or persuade me to become a foundationalist. And how would you do that? All right, we're ready to do that. Losing your foundation that Jesus is the Son of God. I mean, it's if, if you don't faith. have, it's in your faith, but isn't that have to be, if that's what you believe, isn't that have to be the foundation of sure. all that you think and live? I mean, yeah, it is. the bourgeois uh, virtues, it seems, if, if Christianity is true, then the uh, bourgeois is a certain kind placeholder. It's really, yeah. you know, we're living after the first and before the second coming, and one would have to figure out right. progressive eschatology of right. capitalism right. pre- or post-millennial. Right. So why not go down that route like 19th century, century clerical economists? I'm going to. I'm tempted. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am. That is, I, but, but, but I am a, I'm a pluralist. I, I'm a liberal. So I'm not pluralistic about Jesus being the Son of God. Not for me, myself. But That's for, but, well, but, but he's he's the son he's the son of God. But and he he's wants the creator me, of all of us, right? But isn't he, that isn't but, that implied in the, in the syllogism? Be, you want me to be a foundationalist. You want me to be a fundamentalist. No, or I'm saying I don't. I don't really understand how one can claim that Jesus is the Son of God and claim a radical pluralism. I don't, I don't really understand that. There have been agnostics, atheists, suicide cases of all sorts, but yeah. there are very few, it seems to me, individuals who would make a claim as strong as that in the, in the, in the Gospels, and also, it seems to me, make a, a, a definition of liberal pluralism in the way you do. It seems well, that that, for, at the very least, for someone like Taylor, is a tremendous problem. I mean, I can see yeah, I him spinning that. his wheels every time it comes up. It's I a know. tremendous thing. I know it's a problem for Taylor. It's a problem for McIntyre. It's a problem for me. We're, we're all a bunch of, uh, of Christians. But, but, but it, it's, as you said, there's nothing weird about it. As you correctly said, it's, it's 19th century. Progressive, they would call them, they might call themselves now, theologians. There, there, there's no, you know, remarkable impossibility about being a believing Christian and being a pluralist at the same time. Well, but I don't think they would have used the word pluralist. No, they would have used the word pluralist, but be, which has become more popular since then. But they would have used and did use the word liberal. Okay, not the two ladies, but. <coughs> But two, 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 two things. I mean, uh, does he mention Kant? Uh, mm -hmm. You must see the. Isn't, isn't you look, says he. Yeah, he didn't actually say that in German. I'm not sure how he even said it. The then do Kant. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I don't know. Um, the must. Doesn't, do you need, do you, don't you need a must in order to avoid the subsidizes to which you refer to? Why sub societies that can merge within even such as if there were one maybe one merge that there were. But I but but all three of you want me to be sur surely now I can I can not <coughs> generalize about you. You all want me to be monists. I can see that. You want there to be one way of being a human being. And I've known in my life, for example. No, but, 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 but you could have, for example, a a, a, a way of, of, of saying um, this is sort of the, the personal uh, story in, in, in this world, but uh, within society, so we must make sure that in society there is some sort of guard or some sort of a watchdog to make sure that these sub, sub societies do not emerge. Yeah. Right? So there's the state or something. Um, I have the, uh, institutions that, that make sure that, uh, that, cannot, that, that individuals cannot just forget about the other That person. sounds very Kantian. But, but yeah, I, I, okay, uh, all right. Um, but but I, I don't think there must. I mean, I, I, I don't think everyone has to believe the same thing for us to get along with each other and to mutually prosper <coughs> from intellectual exchange, such as we're having here, or from, from uh, 
exchange of commodities or inventions. We don't all have to have the same vision. That's, that's the great virtue of a plural view. Yeah. If, you see, if you keep saying, no, no, you, 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 you must, you must. I, I don't know where the must comes from. No, but I see, I see your project as a very, as a personal project. It's very, as a personal project in the sense personal. that, very, I mean, this is a project for people, yeah, right? Well, uh, but justice, I mean, pe people should have this version okay, of justice, yeah. but justice okay. can only be established in right. your society if you have someone right. who makes sure that yeah. Here, here's, here's what's absolutely correct and quite embarrassing about what you said. This book, the book we're talking about, the first one, is very much about good people. But we're social scientists here, and what we're interested in is good societies. And there's a kind of a very sloppy connection. The, the, the gear box between these two is very loose. But there I join the rest of my colleagues in the social sciences. You know, you, you can make the gearbox very tight by starting with Max Hume and insisting that that's all we're going to do, except it doesn't work. If you have game theory, which is a non cooperative game theory, has been, in my opinion, a disastrous intellectual enterprise. If it's a, if it's a finite game, it unravels rigorously. So much truth. If it's an infinite game, if it's an infinite game, there are an infinite number of solutions. Uh, Amy, back. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed this. I mean, there's, there's something brilliant about what you're doing, and, well, and you seem to be making the argument a very cogent argument that there can't really be a strict separation between economics and political. That's theory. for sure. And. And you are a fan of Adam Smith, but the, the first people who, <laughs> who, uh, who looked into this were the, were the ancients. Yeah. And they had, I think, a different view of it than, than Adam Smith. And I was wondering, in, in particular, I have in my uh, treatise on economics called Zenithan's Economicus. Who again? Zenithan. He's oh. a student of Socrates. I know who he and was, but I, I, I'm ashamed to say I haven't read that. Well, yeah, I'm kind of interested in why, if, if, why you cannot, if economists don't read this book, and because I think it's, it's very well, interesting in this. But I, I have a specific question okay. besides that, and it has to do well, with by, your... By the way, there's an answer to your first question, which is that the economists don't read any books, <laughs> <laughs> from which it follows that they would have read. Well, so Aristotle... I don't want to keep it. <laughs> you're, you're playing to the crowd. <laughs> uh, so Aristotle had uh, would agree with much of this this presentation of the views we have up here. But there's this odd thing at the bottom of like autonomy being male and connection being female. And for him, for Aristotle, Aristotle connected specific virtues to the male and the female with courage with ma the male and uh, temperance with the female. Yeah, and I wonder where you get this odd kind of, it, because the, the rest of your, your, your schema is a, is a really admirable attempt to look at these specific virtues and see how they relate to the economics the economy, and the politics. The economy. Well, but but this, it, this is rather vague, and I think, and, and I think Aristotle would think it's, it's wrong. Well, I, I don't think it's vague, uh, chapter after chapter after chapter talking about the gendered character of these virtues. But you're right. They are not gendered the same way in different societies. I mean, exactly. The, to, to view the females as temperate is a classical idea. But by the, the Renaissance, it's the other way around. They're the intemperate. They're the ones who are wild and sexual. Or at least by the, maybe not by the, well, I don't know. But in any case, later, and then it changes. So it's not it's not a, a timeless assignment. That's why I put the quotation around. That's why I put the scare quotes around these. This, I regard it, um, to speak theologically. Uh, Paul Mutillic spoke of, uh, of the courage to be, which he admired very much as a guy, this was over here, autonomy, and the courage to be a part of, which is the other side. But I think a full human being needs both. 
Um, but in our mythologies, in our way of talking, we do assign this virtue or that. And, and it's kind of crazy. Uh, I have a whole se section in one of the chapters on, uh, on the cowboy myth in the United States. It's, it's growth and decline. And the hard-boiled detective myth, in which um, uh, uh, certainly courage plays a big part. So I, I, it's, it's, it's not as vague as it might appear because I've just put two words on the board. It's, it's not completely fleshed out. I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a feminist, sorry. <laughs> um, and, and I, I, I want, and I think that genders are important. That must be obvious. And I, I, I think that things come gendered, but they don't come gendered forever. I'm not that kind of thing. Fair enough. Um, I think I have a really naive question, but I'm, um, I'm trying to get a grip on the synthesis of this, yeah. of the whole. I haven't read any of the books, but most of the paper. So what you've been saying is clearly that capitalism is not incompatible with virtue. In fact, properly construed, it exhibits a certain balance of the virtues. Right. And uh, your rhetorical uh, opponent there are those many people who say capitalism, capitalism, capitalism and capitalists are immoral. But, but can, can, can I just have a put out there? Because that's from the left. Then from the right is agency theory and right. the assertion that all that matters is proof. Okay, so so one way of understanding that and is that capitalism is just as compatible with social rights as earlier ways of life. Yeah. And in fact, all of your comments about you know the greedy people in every obviously so I, so I get that. So is the claim that capitalism is um, just can be just as virtuous a way of life as other ways of life. Yeah. So the reason we should prefer it is because it gives us more stuff. That, well, so that the competitive advantage of capitalism is that it is productive and it, and it gives us yeah. always more stuff. Or, and this is just, I'm, I just want to get it, or is your claim that actually properly comes true, capitalism uh, can offer a fuller virtuous life, yeah. a better virtuous life, than uh, previous systems. And so there seem to be hints in many ways here, there are hints about, about expressivism or, yeah. or all of these things, that in fact, you're making a bigger claim than uh, for Cap. So uh, that's just well, I'm trying to get it. You know, if we, if we sort of perform the historical counterfactual of supposing that this market innovation didn't produce gigantic increases in income per head as it has. Um, Three dollars a day from the invention of language in Africa to 1800 was the lot of the Nubians. Three dollars a day in Harvard Square prices, that's half a cappuccino <coughs> for the day. No anything else. No books, no shelter, no clothing, no anything, three dollars a day. Now, in the United States, the average is about $125 a day in real terms. And it's a larger amount compared to three dollars a day. It's not just a factor of, of, of 40. It's more like a factor of 100 if you include the increase in quality of goods. So had that not happened, then you're asking me, is the life of a, of, a, uh, of a market society ethically superior to some other life? And I'm not quite sure what I'd say. I, I, mean, I regard property rights as um, blessed. They're not just things that we can um, seize for the good of some property developer or 
to make a public park because some of us think a public park would be nice. So I think the exercise of, of property results in uh, an instinct of, 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 of workmanship, for example. And, and um, a, uh, I mean, it has, it, it, it creates virtues. That, by the way, was a, a, a another thing I wanted to say, that you can make the case not only that virtues are, are good for a market society, they sustain it, but the, and this is what you're asking the other question, to what extent do market societies create virtues? And it, this is an 18th century commonplace. It's the du commerce uh, thesis, sweet commerce, that smooths us in contact like stones rolling in a mountain stream. They get round and smooth. So what do I say to you? Um, ask it again and I'll answer it shortly. <laughs> um, you, you ask it shortly, I'll answer it shortly. Um, so I just, so just take the new command. So the, the, yes, so Adam Smith and, and Tocqueville uh, are, I mean, are willing to uh, certainly grant that capitalism and commercial society has virtue um, and is compatible with a virtuous life. And whether they think that there might be still some horizon of higher virtue kind of put to the side. But on what grounds then um, do we have grounds to prefer capitalism? Yeah. on ethical grounds over, and, and are those grounds of, I mean, you've given a couple egalitarian yeah. that, that uh, maybe they don't produce as much, but it's better distributed. Maybe there are, yeah. maybe people have more expressive freedom. Maybe, yeah. uh, I mean, do. but, uh, so is it some kind of, so you yeah. are making the, yeah. a stronger With, claim. I, I am making a stronger claim, but I'm not too sure of the stronger claim. And you know, if you allow me modern economic growth, then it's easy. Because you get, and it's not true, as many people claim, that modern economic growth is corrupting. I don't think it is. I, and, and I certainly don't think it has to be. There's my trying to play both sides of the street. If it is corrupting, then I, then I have suggestions. Now to make it not corrupting, but I don't think it is corrupting. I don't think, let me, Concretely, I think we have there are more artists alive now, probably than in the entire history of the earth, and that there are more poets. And choose your art. So I I think that we, um, but it's much harder to make. Not one of them is worth a van. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that would then be, that would then be, be the problem. I think that's true. Uh, you get back. Well, my question is related to what you were just saying. So, if the point is to see how capitalism fosters virtue, yeah. what would you say, like to the poor right now? I mean, to the poor right now. Yeah, I mean, if, yeah, if the point is that to show that even successful capitalists can be virtuous, yeah, and to say that maybe capitalism has some hope to, in the future, redistribute like better. Uh, well, I don't know. Yeah. But right now, but right now, what would a poor, well, what I, would I, you have I to say? I would say to the poor, um, I would not say, as Cain does, this character uh, from, from, from Pizza Land, I would not say, you're, 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 you're just a bunch of bums, go stop being envious of the rich. That's not what I said. I'm a motherly libertarian, not a fatherly. So. I believe in free societies and free economies. And I would say to the poor, now look, I want to help you. In fact, I had a strange encounter this spring, last spring at a um, meeting of libertarians. They were all over the place. <laughs> and I was, I, was, I was talking to one, and I said, well, by, by, by way of sort of stating an axiom that we all agree with, well, we all want to help the poor. And he immediately said, no, only if they help me. It's like being hit in the chest. And that's not my view. 
Um, but you, you ask me how, I would speak to them and say, okay, guys, look, believe me, the improvement of poor people depends on this engine of increasing the size of the pie. I'm perfectly willing to expropriate the expropriators. You can only do it once, though. <laughs> Because if you make a habit of it, you're not going to have any expropriators around. There aren't going to be any entrepreneurs. So that's not going to work for it. And I can persuade them that what we used to call at Chicago, the, at the University of Chicago, the golden rule holds. Those who have the gold rule. So let's gather together. Let's have tents on the Cambridge Common. Workers of the world unite, demand capitalism. Because it's that that's made them comparatively well off. I've got another question myself. Yeah, do. Uh, this is uh, another attempt to, to show that you that you're not a pluralist. I'm not a pluralist. Yeah, sure. Yes. So you've got seven virtues here. Yes. Sir. Sacred number. Yes, it yes. is. Uh, there aren't more. No. And there mustn't be fewer. No, not sure. They're all there. So these seven virtues make of a full and complete human being. Well, well lacking in nothing. Yeah. And uh, and is able to switch from one sex to another. Say. Yeah, so that as to, so as to combine the excellences of women with those um, less Satisfactory of men, yes. <laughs> well, that, that <laughs> so, wasn't so my this first this, purpose. So, I this, so this is uh, this will be a full and complete human being, and not only have the seven virtues, but they would all be in harmony. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so that's isn't that your ground, your yeah. standard? It is, and uh, and that's a single standard. Yeah, it's a. Every, it's, one, every other standard is so inadequate. Or that's, that's right. It's a single standard, but it's a plural standard. <laughs> it's the, a flourishing human life. And there are many, it's, it, it's Aristotle, as someone said. It, uh, it's a flourishing human life. And, but as, to go back, to say it again, I said to appeal to Isaiah Berlin, I had a strange experience. I mean, my, last year I gave a talk at All Souls College on this book, Many Economic Historians. And the actual um, audience was composed mainly of people who were rather hostile to free, um, well, what I call free societies. But there at the end was a portrait of Isaiah Berlin, at the end of the seminar room. So I spoke to him, which worked out just fine. <laughs> and Isaiah Berlin points out that, that what we want, or what I want, is a society in which there are various different ways of being human. And that those are, have their merits. They have their demerits, too. So we, we must keep, keep we, 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 I'm not saying anything goes. I'm not saying any kind of life, uh, sadomasochist, um, t uh, um, torture of children is fine because it's a way of life. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but, I, but I am saying, look, I've had five close friends who were Catholic nuns. Either there was one who was a former Catholic nun and four who were Catholic nuns. And in their own way, that's a glorious life. I've had friends, not too many, but I've had a few friends who were soldiers. And it, their own way, that's a glorious life. It's an idiosyncratic combination of these. We paint our own lives. Now there we're getting back to romanticism again. But we paint within the color scheme that the art critics want. So no, I, I don't think I'm, I'm at least here, let, let me say it this way. At least it's not a slam bang maximization of one thing that that the that the max you of the world would take. But aren't you saying then that a pluralist society which consists of a collection of individuals with an interesting variety of demerits is uh, intelligible by 
this single standard of what makes human beings uh, admirable. Yeah, it is. And, and there is, okay, I, I can see that. There's a single standard, I agree with you. But it's, it's, a, it's a funny kind of single standard because it doesn't sound Kantian to me, it doesn't sound bit, uh, 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 Bentham. It's not nutty. It's not, <laughs> it's not nutty, it's not, that's right, it's not one virtue, justice only in Kant. One virtue, prudence only in, in Bentham. One virtue, courage only in But I'm thinking that authority is a big deal. Please criticize this metaphor. You're proposing a well-integrated corporation in which the employees are using four different types of computer systems. Yeah. They don't do that. Yeah, but the, I don't accept the necessity for a society to act like a corporation. I mean, mm -hmm. the, 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 the advantage of corporation is that it does have a maximum. Well, it has practical yeah. integration to do stuff. Yeah. And it does it efficiently and to all benefits. That's right, but it's not, it's not stuff, it's making automobiles. It's making one thing. It's, so it's, it's much harder to say, oh, well, that's nice. There's a branch of Volvo where they just sit around and do paper and pencil exercises. Though there is. I was in the Volvo factory. The, the, uh, the, the, Vice President took me around, and and, and they, they do have, they do find in in well-run companies. There's not this this one. Well, actually, well, let's take an example. The Ford Way. I was at a conference in in Dearborn, and that town is a kind of mausoleum to Henry Ford. The whole town is enormous structures. Henry Ford, Henry Ford, Henry Ford, and the Ford Way does tend to be a kind of let's all march to not to the not to the uh, music that we hear uh, <coughs> measure from far away, let's march to the monkey. And that might work for automobiles. It may not work very well for automobiles, but it certainly doesn't work for a whole big diverse society like ours. Can I clarify the one thing? Are you making a nomological model of uh, virtue of virtues, or is this meant to be a model for description? Well, it's both. It's, it, it's both? That's my two sides of the street that I'm uh -huh. trying to play. I'm trying to say we should have virtuous capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, by the way, we do. If so, we're completely virtuous, uh -huh. then the first point would be completely pointless. The no point of saying we should have a a godly society if we've if we've established this established the city of God on earth. So you basically think that this uh, today's situation is um, uh, pretty close to the nomological model. That's and, what I'd say. Uh -huh. Contrary so, to all the, the so, what we say have been saying for two so years in this book. I haven't read your book actually, so this might be an odd question. For example, uh, the category of justice. Or yeah. love. Mm -hmm. Like, well, as, as I've talked to you before, the speech I'm a bit mm -hmm. and then yeah. obviously what Max Weber meant in one sense was the justice and love was like converted by the Calvinist song. It was different in Catholic, oh, yeah. but I justice guess. and love, well, like, well, in Calvinist thought, you don't have to care about them. The dad, they'll go to hell. Yeah. So, well, in Calvinism, you say. Yeah, in Calvinism. Yeah. So, what I'm asking is that justice and love can be defined very differently. Yeah, so, yeah. if you're talking about normative character, and you can only define it in one way, it cannot be like for, for a description. Uh, yeah, you can act like a uh, the justice depends on history or culture. But I understand what you're saying. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, that that. That's right, and I would say that, my, in, in a way, the whole point of that book is mm -hmm. that these words, which are in various different languages, very ancient and 
part of it. And lines and stories and philosophies and drama and song uh, forever. Um, shift in their meaning through history. And, and you're right that I, I and then, then we, 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 we get back to the, to the monism. I'm, of course, viewing it from the 21st century as a person who thinks that love is really neat. And, and, um, whereas who, who, love doesn't play a big part in the, in the pagan virtues. Um, but, but so far as I wish I had a word to substitute for capitalism, can anyone think about a free market? What? Free markets, but then that, that makes it sound like freedom is all that's at stake there. Market society. Market society is good, but then it says that only markets matter. It's innovation that matters. What about um, Karl Popper's open society? Yeah, that's a good one. Maybe I'll do that. <laughs> open society. Because that's what is crucial. Because you can have a bourgeois society that's closed. And that's the danger in modern American politics, at least that's what they're always talking about. That you have lots of members of the bourgeoisie, but they're all um, tied into the power elite and so forth. But but so yeah, there there's a there there's a drift. But what I'm saying is that what is denied on both the left and the right, you can coherently, intelligently with a lot of factual evidence, <laughs> apply ethical words to the open society. Yeah, to, to, to bring it back to uh, the points yeah. Professor Mansfield and Professor Welsh were making, but uh, if take, so like you said before, if we take away the consequences of capitalism, the, yeah. the, 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 the economic growth, so capitalism, strictly speaking, is Thrasymachus could say in, in, in uh, Plato's Republic, um, uh, th this has to do with the uh, with the pluralism uh, idea. Is that if another system other than capitalism represented all of these virtues for you, which is the standard, it seems, would that system then be as equally acceptable to you as capitalism, strictly speaking, minus the economic growth? I don't think it's a feasible society. That is, we have always had exchange from the beginning. We've always been traders. Um, and we've always had ownership. This idea that ownership is going to be some sort of, or, or the Carl Bologna idea that I see as you be smarter than brother Michael, that um, uh, market societies are new, that there weren't any labor markets in England, I'm practically quoting them. Until 1820. I mean, this this is this is pot This is nonsense. Um, we've always had them, and so it's it's very hard to perform the counterfactual. It's very it's it's kind of how would you do it? Let's suppose that we were in a world with no gravity. Well, you yeah, know, okay, but that's going to be very hard to model. Um, <laughs> Makes sense of yeah. Uh, it came in late, so if you've already answered this question or anticipated it, then just, just pass on. But, um, what, what about the financialization of the economy in the last several decades? I mean, the American economy is, to an um, alarming extent, located in a server farm in Secaucus, New yeah. Jersey. Uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, well, that's the way innovation is. These financial innovations are not in themselves bad. They've been overdone, way overdone. One of the reasons they've been overdone is that we of the clerisy have been claiming all the time that Wall Street, that capitalism is anyway corrupt, whether from the left or the right, we say this. We say, oh, they're just a bunch of Max you guys. And the idea of professionalism in banking and insurance and, 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 uh, and finance has just gone out the window. And the masters of the universe, all of them under 40, um, who have um, degrees in finance, have run the financial system into the ground. 
But we've not been completely <coughs> impoverished by this. Let's get this straight. The national income fell by 6%. That's very alarming. But it's crawling its way back. And this has happened over and over and over again. In, before the modern world, it happened because wars and, and, and plagues and, and, uh, and, and famines and so forth. Now it happens, well, sometimes because of wars and plagues and famines, but mainly because of some sort of internal <coughs> um, logic that we keep hoping we're going to figure out called, can someone close that door? Called the, called the new business cycle. We've had 40 of them since 1800, 4 zero. Some of them have been these bad financial ones, like the one we just had, like in the 1890s um, or the 18, 1840s. But we overdo innovations all the time. Slicing and dicing mortgages in order that my brother, who works as a janitor, can get a mortgage is not in itself evil. If a diverse portfolio can induce the financial system to lend to more poor people, I'm not against that. But we go too far. We went too far with railways, and we had collapses. We went too far with automobiles, and we had collapses. We went too far to take a smaller case with the dot-com boom, and we had collapses. Then we kind of got ourselves up on our feet and said, gee, that was terrible. Maybe we better not go so far with dot-com companies or railways. So, so all I'm saying is that we must not throw away the financial innovations. They're good things, not bad. That's very good, and uh, we, we have to stop. This woman is so full of truth that it even comes out of the side of her mouth. <laughs> <laughs>